screen now. Yes, uh, thank you all for, for coming today and for being here. It is my great pleasure that we have Winfried Rief today here as, um, as our speaker, as our invited speaker. And Winfried is one of the PIs in our SFB and he will talk today about the role of expectations in depression. And I would now hand over to Julian who's going to introduce Winfried. And after that, we will begin with the talk. So thank you very much everyone for participating and I wish us all a lovely, a lovely talk and discussion. Yeah, thank you, Katarina. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome Professor Winfried Rief as today's webinar speaker. Um, Professor Rief studied psychology in Trier, uh, finished his PhD in Constance, and achieved his habilitation in Salzburg. Um, today, as Professor of Clinical Psychology and Psychotherapy and Head of the Outpatient Clinic for Psychological Interventions, at the University of Marburg, he combines both scientific and clinical excellence. Among others, his research interests focus on the role of expectations in mental and somatic disorders. Um, he is highly renowned um, expert and has, for instance, uh, been awarded with the Distinguished Scientist Award by the International Society of Behavioral Medicine and was invited guest professor at the University of Auckland, uh, the Harvard Medical School, and the University of California, San Diego. Uh, as Katarina already told you, uh, within our collaborative research center, Professor Reeve is both principal investigator and site speaker at the University of Marburg. And today, I'm very much looking forward to his talk about the role of expectations in depression. So thank you for being here today, and the stage is all yours now. Thank you, Julian and Kati. It's a great honor for me that, that you invited me to present some ideas and results of uh, my work during the last 10 years. So are you able to see my screen? Yes, we see your slides. If you now start the presentation mode, I think yeah. it's perfect. Okay, I'll switch to... Now it should be perfect. It's okay, yes, Kati? Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as you all know, a lot of research has been done in the field of placebo and nocebo uh, in the area of pain. Uh, and today I want to talk uh, whether we can uh, translate these findings to the field of the affective system to depression in particular. And uh, first I want to start with some disclosure, uh, conflict of interest. As you all know, I work for the placebo industry. From a financial point of view, this is not encouraging uh, because uh, you do not really make money uh, and you don't get big money from the industry. But uh, I have to tell you that for me, uh, switching to this field was really highly rewarding. The collaboration with some of the people that you know already and others that are not shown on this picture was really stimulating and changed my way of thinking about clinical interventions in general. So let's come back to uh, placebo and nocebo effect in, in depression. And I want to start first with the, some observations that uh, arise from clinical trials. And if we talk about the efficacy of, of antidepressants in particular, uh, then I think this is the best meta-analysis that has been published during the last decade uh, from Ms. Cipriani and others. And uh, I think the final result uh, is shown above here. The standard mean difference this is pretty similar to Cohen's D and other effect sizes uh, measures. This point 30 for the advantage of antidepressants against placebos in, in a lot of clinical trials, some of them unpublished trials, etc. So what does this mean? A stand, uh, uh, an effect size of 0 0.30 is a low effect size uh, and notably uh, we still find the biggest effect size for one of the oldest antidepressants by, while some of the typical SSRIs and new ones uh, show even smaller effect sizes than this average 0 0.30 effect size. So a small effect size that means that Either there is a small effect or there are some other 
factors influencing the difference between placebo and nocebo and, and, and drug groups that contribute to these differences. That means we do not need we do not need a lot of other factors. We need only a slight difference that can contribute and explain the full difference between antidepressants and placebo applications. So can we see these small effect sizes in clinical trials, in single trials? Yes, we can. And I just show you one example, but this is a very typical one uh, that's associated with the introduction of valdoxan, agomelatin uh, that was introduced about 10 years ago. Uh, it has a little bit different way of action, but the results are pretty similar for this drug compared to other drugs in comparison to placebos. You see, when we start with the treatments, there's a strong decrease of depression in both groups, drug group and placebo group. And at some time points, there are some differences. They even seem to vanish or to decrease at least uh, with continuing treatments. So we see there's a strong decrease in the drug group. The drug is effective, but there's also a strong decrease in the placebo group. And this leads us to the question, oh, is this maybe just a regression to the mean effect? We always include patients to clinical trials when they are at the top of suffering. And uh, then it's pretty likely that the development, whatever you do, is decrease of symptoms. But therefore, one trial is uh, very interesting and, and, and giving us further information whether this is a true placebo effect or whether this is just regression to the mean. And this is a study of Lukter and others. Uh, and uh, they were able to show that in their group, the improvement of patients receiving active antidepressants, uh, this is a significant improvement, but the improvement in the placebo group is also quite impressive and only slightly different from the active drug group. While a third group was included, and this group only received supportive care, no drug pill, no placebo pill. And we can see that the improvement in this third group is much less than the improvement in the other two groups. So it's not just regression to the mean, but it is really also positive and strong effect in the arm where patients receive placebo pills. So this leads us to the question is, can we really replicate these kind of findings and show it more directly. And uh, therefore, one study is also interesting uh, of Faria and others. And they used only active drug. It was uh, Citalopram, which is one of the top sold uh, antidepressants currently. Uh, and they used this drug either in an op open uh, version, saying this is a strong, powerful drug. This will help you to cope in this case, but social anxieties, uh, or they use the very same drug, the active pill, but they use the kind of cover story. This is an, just an active placebo that we use for different reasons, but that is not supposed to change your clinical symptoms. And what they well, were able to show is that it, it's just it, the instruction that makes a huge difference between the efficacy of this drug and if people get the right instruction, it is a powerful tool. It helps uh, to uh, at least half of the group to significantly reduce their social anxieties. While if you use the very same active drug, uh, but with the wrong instruction, the efficacy drops down to uh, about 10%. So we can say the instruction, the, the placebo effects, the expectation effects, they are really contributing significantly to the overall effect of uh, uh, antidepressants. And what can we say about the negative effects? And this is just an observation stuff study of our friends and uh, colleagues in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand has a unique healthcare system because the country is small. Uh, they make only agreements with one single enterprise, single enterprise to use one single uh, specific drug uh, so they get better conditions and can save some money. Uh, about uh, five, some years ago, uh, 2017 to 2018, uh, the uh, organization that is responsible for that, the 
farm uh, in New Zealand, uh, they switched the drug Venla vaccine to the generic Enlafax. So it was pretty much the same. It was the same drug, but they just changed uh, the, the, the shape of the drug, etc. And when they did this, nothing changed. Uh, these are the reports of significant uh, uh, side effects and the reports to the general authorities about uh, reduced therapeutic response. And you can see nothing happened after the introduction of this change until February, five months after introduction. Uh, and then there was a substantial increase of re official reports of side effects and official reports of decreased therapeutic response. Uh, what was the reason for that? There were some ce celebrities in the media who reported about decreased efficacy of the new uh, application of this very same drug. So there is a strong effect of public reports about efficacy and side effects on the efficacy at the side of a uh, uh, patient. So we have some public uh, indices for, for this kind of, of, of expectation effects. Uh, and uh, this brought us these kind of results for us to analyze uh, the side effect profiles of uh, antidepressants because it's pretty strong and we pretty much suppose this, that the old tricyclics have different side effect profiles than SSRIs. I've seen that Yvonne Nestorio is with up to a day and she was also working with me together to bring up these results. And here we were able to show that as expected, the tricyclics induce more side effects than the SSRIs uh, with the typical symptom of dry mouth uh, in the tricyclic arm and less dry mouth symptoms in the SSRI, etc. So, but what is unique about these results? This is not the drug arms, these results, but these are the results of the placebo arms. That means only the expectation of study physicians and uh, study patients that they will develop more specific side effects in the TCA group than in your SSRI group already led to different reports of side effects in the placebo arms of, of these uh, trials. And there are meanwhile several studies who did the same approach in the field of uh, migraine treatment, etc. And just recently we submitted a paper about the uh, side effects reported in the uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials in the placebo arms. And again, we are able to show there are very specific side effects in these placebo arms for the side effects that are expected in the drug arms. And uh, again, in, in, in the vaccination programs, I don't show you the results here, but in the current vaccination programs, we have at least about 40 to 50% of side effects uh, in, in the placebo arms compared to the side effects in the drug arms. So these are direct or indirect observations of clinical trials. So can we modulate these effects if we use experimental trials? To investigate this, we need an experimental model uh, to, to modulate expectation effects um, in, in, in the report of depressive symptoms. And what we have done is that we used our favorite placebo. This is a nasal spray. Others use pills or lotions, as you know. So we thought we need something unique. And therefore, we use nasal sprays. And we always tell that we investigate new application forms of well-known drugs that are very powerful. And in this case, we show a video clip about four to five minutes, uh, four to five minutes. Uh, it's about the jam a video which is really heartbreaking because the father a boxer dies in the arms of the son uh, and it's really touching uh, if you want to get some sadness induction just watch this video and then we investigate sadness again so in one of the cover stories we say that this nasal spray is citalopram a powerful antidepressant that helps to regulate mood and to avoid negative changes of uh, your mood. 
And you also use placebo uh, instructions that this is just a placebo in a control group that did not receive any uh, medical intervention. We also have a nocebo group, but I will not talk about this that much. Um, so all of these people got nasal sprays. So sorry for not translating this slide. I will come to a similar slide in a second that shows the English uh, uh, word for, for the, the graphics. Uh, but here is the results. And you see that all groups show a similar increase of sadness after watching the video with the champ, only this group has a different course. And this is our placebo instruction group. Now, this is the group that received the nasal spray with the instruction. This nasal spray will diminish any negative feelings and it will block the de development of negative feelings. And as you can see, it really happened in our placebo uh, instruction group. And you, what you can see here, talking about effect sizes, now we talk about large effect sizes. You remember the small effect sizes in the long-term trials investigating uh, antidepressants, long-term means eight weeks. Uh, and this year are only short-term effects, but as you can see, the short-term effects are, are, are quite powerful. They are, these are strong effect sizes. But can we find and modulate these kind of effects uh, in patients, yes, we can. We have shown this in another trial with only including patients with major depression. And again, this is after randomization. Uh, then people see the movie and uh, we have the group, the control group that reports more sadness after seeing the movie. And in red, we have the uh, group that got the instruction. This would be citalopram. And what you can see is that our depressed people even feel better after watching this sadness inducing video if they get the citalopram instruction without receiving placebo, as told before. And we have something in between. This is an open label placebo without receiving a strong instruction. So here, participants, patients uh, only got the information this is a placebo without the additional information, this will increase your self-help strategies, etc. cetera. Uh, so we can see if you use open label placebos in, in, uh, in depression, it ha this has some positive effects, but uh, the deceptive effect of uh, the uh, use of uh, in, uh, placebos is much stronger. And even paradoxically, an improvement of uh, sadness uh, after watching this video. Meanwhile, we also try to investigate whether we can modulate single symptoms of uh, depression. And here's just one example. We investigated rumination. So again, we uh, did some induction of sadness here. Uh, and then uh, we had a randomization. Uh, and people again got the nasal spray with a deceptive placebo instruction or no treatment uh, group here. And then we induced some rumination. Uh, there are some standardized uh, procedures to induce rumination. Uh, and we investigate whether this deceptive placebo has some protective effects or not. And we can confirm we can even modulate single symptoms of uh, that, that, that belong to the cluster of depression uh, in our placebo experiment. We also used another design. Uh, this is so-called cross-like panel analysis. Yvonne can tell you all the details about the, this kind of method. Uh, but but here's, what's interesting here is we have a, a first assessment point of the clinical syndrome here, depression. And expectation is something that is of particular interest in, in, in our field. So we, in, in, in depression, the maybe the most relevant uh, expectation is about social rejection. So we can investigate this, and this has some correlation, point 54, uh, which makes sense. But then we investigate both features uh, two months later. And uh, the most interesting thing about this cross-like panel analysis are always the diagonals. And we can see that 
is some predictive value in depression of time point one to social rejection at time point two, but there's an even higher and significant, as I say, prediction of social rejection expectations at time point one to depression at time point two. <clears throat> and that means social rejection expectations are a predictor of worsening of depression. Uh, that's something we can conclude from this uh, study. And this brought us to further evaluate and develop other designs uh, that enable us to investigate these deepest fears and expectations of people uh, who uh, are at risk of suffering from depression. And this paradigm is something we call no one likes you. And it, this acronym already tells you uh, the direction we are going now. So the procedure is as following. We uh, ask for a rating. Do you expect that other will reject you if you present something personal? Uh, and then people are invited to present something personal, uh, such as what does friendship mean to you? That means uh, in contrast to other social rejection paradigms, our paradigm uses some, something that is really of relevance for you personally as a subject of this experiment. So it's about friendship, it's about next holiday or something that has some relevance, not intimidating, but has some personal relevance. And then you have to talk to a virtual partner uh, via the screen uh, and the partner is watching you. And after about 30 to 40 seconds, this stops and uh, then the partner gives you some feedback. Uh, and this feedback can be as harsh as this one. Your last listener found you rather uninteresting and would like to get in touch with you again. So what happened here? Uh, that means uh, this was this a real experience of social rejection. Uh, we really induce some kind of negative feelings and this was quite obvious. So this is the part of the paradigm. You can see here like the, the acting partners are either, either not interested and showing some disinterest or they are quite friendly, showing some interest. Uh, and now we can use this paradigm uh, to investigate uh, feelings of social rejection and to modulate these feelings either using placebo applications or using variations of the instruction. So now I want to switch back to side effects. Can we modulate side effects uh, in our uh, paradigms? And the most simple way of inducing side effects is to uh, induce something in our application that induces some kind of feeling, not really pain, not really something harmful, but some prickling in the nose. And this is easily achieved if you use capsaicin, not too much of it, of course, uh, in our nasal spray, and uh, so this is chili pepper, and then you uh, use the nasal spray and you feel some prickling. And we use this paradigm again with the heat pain uh, paradigm uh, that is quite familiar to many of you. Uh, and we use this application to investigate the role of expectation in typical clinical trials. Typical clinical trials means people believe they are in a 50-50% condition. They do not know whether they get the real active drug or a placebo. Uh, and some people get the instruction, you are in the active drug group, and some got the instruction, you are in the placebo group. And all people, whatever instruction they got, just received our nasal spray. But some, the active nasal spray with the uh, crippling in the nose, and the others a passive placebo. So what we can see that the difference between believing I get the drug versus believing I get the placebo is already in the medium effect size range. And most importantly for clinical trials, randomized clinical trials, the difference between having some kind of on-site effect in the, uh, in, in, in the placebo group versus no on-site effects is already a, a, a medium effect size effect. Uh, and this is of most relevance if you think back to 
the small difference between antidepressant applications and placebo applications that I have shown at the beginning. Uh, because this means in antidepressant active drug groups, we have on side effects. And for a drug like amitriptyline, for instance, 95% of healthy controls experience side effects, so nearly 100%. And this is something that shouldn't happen, at least not that strongly, in, in the placebo group. And that means we do not know yet whether all the positive effects in antidepressant trials go mainly back to the fact that they induce onset effects and side effects. But what, what else can we learn about side effects? Uh, together with colleagues from uh, Alexander Winkler, who is now in, in Gießen, and Bettina and others, we did a classical conditioning uh, trial using amitriptyline, which induces side effects, as mentioned before. But here it was a blinded application uh, versus placebo. They also got some drinks. We got some recommendations of Manfred Shedlowski about that. Uh, he's expert, expert in drinks, as you know. Uh, so people got four applications of amitriptyline or placebo in the evening, then we had a, have a washout period, and then people of both groups got placebo. So this is a classical conditioning paradigm for acquisition trials, and then we have an evocation trial. So what happens? The report of drugs attributed side effects clearly shows the acquisition effect no side effects or nearly no side effects in the placebo group and uh, quite strong side effect reports in the amitriptyline group and what happens at evocation when both groups receive just placebos uh, we find we still find increased scores for side effects in the uh, people in the group that received amitriptyline before that means the report of side effects in clinical practice is frequently something that people have learned. This is not the reaction to a drug, to the pharmacology of the drug, or this is not only sensitivity, but this is also learning experience. And therefore, some attempts in clinical practice will fail uh, if doctors switch from one group of drugs to the other, hoping that people will not report side effects anymore, uh, but then the people report them. And this means that they have learned to develop side effects, whatever kind of drug they receive. So what can we make of all this? Uh, can we make some clinical sense of it? I do not want to go through the clinical trial that we did in our heart surgery patients, but just want to remember we did that trial, I've said that Johannes Laverton is with us today. Uh, I'm very happy, Johannes, that you are here. Uh, he could tell you all the details uh, of this study. But what we can mainly say, if we optimize patients' expectations before they undergo any invasive clinical interventions, we can improve outcome. That's what we have done here. Uh, to save some time, I will just skip it and uh, here again are the results. We optimized outcome expectations before patients underwent heart surgery. And six months later, people report improvements in terms of disability. And if you look at the raw scores, just watch that. It's here, it's about 26 at the beginning at baseline, and it's about 12 to 14. Uh, six months later. So it's half of, uh, of the disability, disability that patients have reported before treatment. And you can see this is mainly due to the psychological intervention. If they only got the heart surgery, there's a modest improvement. Heart surgery ensures the survival, which is important, of course, but it doesn't really improve the quality of life. And we need the psychological interventions to have good quality of life six months after heart surgery. But it's still a nice story that we got some postcards of our patients who did some of the projects we talked with them before they underwent uh, the heart surgery. In this case, a lady that sent us a postcard from Lago di Como because she was so happy that she was able to visit this place. 
So just to summarize what's the effect of our Sihar study, we can optimize our expectations if we focus on expectations. This is really a key mechanism uh, that leads to improvement. And if, if you hit the nail, if you really hit the key mechanism, then even very short-term interventions can lead to highly efficient outcomes. And maybe you know that Keith Petway has meanwhile used a very similar paradigm, but even uh, shortening the uh, uh, expectation optimization condition to a, like five to 10 minutes intervention. Uh, and he was able to show that this leads, leads to improvement uh, in people who undergo other medical interventions. So what's so unique about expectations? Uh, and I think that this quotation of uh, the hockey player, Ray Bradsky, brings it to the point. He declaring that his case where the puck is go, the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And this shows so clearly that expectations make us powerful in surviving in our uh, environment. Uh, only if I'm able to predict what will happen next, I will have some advantages in coping with the situation. So expectations are our link to the future. They are determining the future. They are also of relevance to determine uh, the, the symptom course. Uh, if I believe that some ear noises will vanish the next two minutes, two seconds, they do, they, I don't care about them. But if I think these ear noises will always persist. I will never hear silence again. Then I will suffer from it and we will call it tinnitus. And the same is true for pain. We are able to cope with so intense bad feelings if we know and if we expect they will vanish soon. But uh, if we believe they will not vanish for months and years, then it's pretty hard to cope with it. So I don't talk about prediction coding machine, you all know about that stuff. But this brought us to the point to reformulate clinical conditions such as depression or post-traumatic stress disorder as disorders of expectation. And we try to identify the unique expectations of single mental disorders. Because meanwhile, we believe that expectations are in the core of understanding mental disorders. Uh, some of you are uh, familiar with RDOG research domain criteria. That's the thinking of RDOG to focus on those mechanisms that are really crucial for understanding uh, mental disorders. So let's focus again on depression. What are the most specific expectations for people who are depressed? One of them is social rejection. I talked about that earlier. The other is lack of social report, support. If I ask Arsenal to help me or to give me some advice, they will reject me, they will not support me. Lack of uh, emotion regulation expectations. If I have bad feelings, I can nothing do. I can, I'm not able to modulate my own feelings. And negative expectations about test performance. These, these are the major clusters of depression specific expectations. And you can break them down to more unique and more uh, single expectations. But I'll come to this later. But this means if expectations <coughs> are the core of mental disorders, then therapy is pretty simple. You have to identify the dysfunctional expectations. You have to do something that, that violates these expectations, and then you get some expectation change. Let's use this model for uh, anxiety disorders. You have the expectation, I will die if I'm exposed to, uh, to a car ride on the German autobahn. Uh, then you do expectation violation in terms of uh, exposure and the expectation will change. This can happen, especially if you use very strong expectation violations. But as you know, there are patients uh, that do not follow this principle. And what's of relevance here, because these patients use cognitive immunization strategies. If this happened now, this was just the exception of the rule. The rule will maintain, I maintain my belief of dysfunctional expectations of something awful will happen if I'm exposed to this or that situation. 
or I don't believe in the person who is giving me the expectation violating uh, information. Uh, that's what we can see nowadays in, in uh, vaccination hesitancy, for instance. People who uh, say you cannot believe what's shown in German TV, uh, therefore I only believe uh, in social media, for instance. So you use some cognitive immunization strategies to block the effect of expectation violation. And we can also translate this to a more base oriented model. Uh, let's take again the depressed patient uh, or they, no, let's start with you. You are a positive person and you think most people are quite friendly and something happens. You meet someone and he is so, so la la. Uh, so the current situation is somewhere in your expected range that people are friendly because if this is a strong expectation, it has a broad expectation framework and curve. And you will consider this experience that you have with that person as a confirmation of your positive experience. You only change this positive expectation frame if something really violating is happening. Very bad experience like traumatization. Uh, then you might change your, your generalized expectations that people are quite friendly. So please check this arrow here. This is at the same place here. And here's our depressed person. And the depressed person has a negative expectation framework. And that means this very same experience that is a confirmation for you that the world is good is a confirmation for this person that most people are quite unfriendly. The very same information is interpreted in a very different way. And for this patient, for instance, uh, we would need a very powerful expectation violating situation, uh, very friendly behavior that might be able to change this negative belief. And maybe sometimes we, this, this negative belief is so broad that we cannot provide any information that it's really violating this negative belief system. I think in patients with chronic pain, this is typically the case. So this shows we need powerful expectation violating situations and or we need to reduce the effect of cognitive immunization to be successful. So we use this kind of paradigm to better understand depression. And so what have we found so far? Uh, we started with people uh, asking about their expectations and then we induce negative expectations using paradigms like the no one likes you paradigm or others uh, that I've shown before. And it was interesting to see that it doesn't matter whether people are depressed or not depressed. The development of negative expectations was pretty much the same in our trials compared uh, in, in, in our trials uh, between depressed and non-depressed people. So the development development of negative expectations is not unique for depressed patients. Uh, then if we, the, the, the point of change that occurred afterwards, and which is most interesting, was that we then induced positive experiences. After developing negative expectations, there was always a period of developing, of, of trying to modify these negative expectations by positive experiences. Uh, and we are able to show that this is the difference between depressed patients and healthy controls. Uh, healthy controls will switch back to positive expectations if they have positive experiences after negative experiences, uh, while people with, with depression, they will stick to the negative expectation and they do not change. And this is something we can even modulate in healthy controls. If we induce negative mood, this shows us the same effect that they're switching back to positive expectations after negative experiences is clean, is blocked, is uh, hindered by negative mood. And people with depression, they use kind of cognitive immunization strategies to stick to the depression. If someone meets a depressed person and smiles to that person and is very friendly, uh, the depressed person says, oh, he, he or she does not mean it. Uh, he's not taking it seriously. Uh, he, in, in reality, he doesn't like me but it's just plain. So this is cognitive immunization. This is not depression itself. 
like I'm a bad person, I'm not, I'm worthless. But this is cognitive, cognitive immunization that blocks the change to the positive. And uh, therefore, our model is that people are the more people are, the, the more the depression is getting chronic, uh, the more cognitive immunization, immunization strategies are used. So let's summarize at this point. We can say in depression, expectations play a really crucial role, uh, not only for the treatment, but also for understanding the core mechanisms of depression. Uh, and if people and people uh, stick to depressive de expectations, to negative expectations, because many of them use cognitive immunization strategies. We have to be aware that even depressed patients, they have positive events that happen in their life. Uh, that means they meet friendly people, they have some other success, but they do not really make sense of it, they do not really experience it. And we, here we have the link to uh, to reward insensitivity, another concept that is pretty close to our concept. With our experimental paradigm, we were able to modulate effects of expectation development, maintenance, and change. Uh, and uh, so far, we would say the unique thing about depressed people is not the development of the depression of depressed expectations, but it's the lack of change afterwards. And with our paradigms, no one likes you. We are pretty close to these kind of feelings that really happen. Some of you know other paradigms to investigate social uh, rejection, etc. But uh, I can tell you from our own experience, uh, it is really very lively and, and very intense, uh, this kind of feeling that people have to in the no one likes you paradigm. But that means also for our treatment, if we want to improve treatment in depression, we have to assess the specific expectations. We have to develop interventions that violate these expectations or that check them. Uh, and we have to uh, use interventions that reduce cognitive immunization strategies. And if you use these strategies, then we can maybe improve depression treatment because so far we cannot be satisfied with the level that we achieve be it with pharmacotherapy, be it with, with psychotherapy. So to conclude, uh, just with a comic, uh, one of us is a placebo. Uh, I think uh, the message I want to give you is all of us should be really good placebos. We should make use of this kind of, uh, of, of knowledge that we acquire in our uh, transregio about expectations. This is such an important field and I'm so happy that I included this field in my career about 10 to 15 years ago. So thank you so far, and I'll stop at this point. <laughs>